Hey everybody, thanks for coming to join me. I'm Laura and today we're going to talk about Charleston. No partner necessary. But first, Thank you, people of Patreon, for helping to make this video free for everybody in the world, including people like you. If you want to join them, it's a voluntary subscription, and the link is in the description. Charleston is an old dance. Beside the cakewalk, it was the first dance to be popular among both black and white dancers in the United States. For the record, both of those dances were invented by black Americans. But this dance is so much older than the flappers and fringe dresses of the roaring 1920s. It goes all the way back to Africa, and this little dance has some staying power too, it is still done contemporarily not only by Lindy Hoppers but by house dancers as well. If you want more information about its history, and there is a lot of it, check out the link in the description. One of the advantages of Charleston is it can be done with or without a partner. In this video, we will be partnerless. We're going to start with Flapper Charleston, or 1920s Charleston as it's called by many Lindy Hoppers today. Back in the Roaring Twenties, nothing bad will ever happen, just like today, right? World's going great. Quick note, I suspect at the time it wasn't called 1920s Charleston, it was just called Charleston. In an interview with Margaret Batichek in 1988, Frankie Manning, who was a second generation Lindy Hopper at the Savoy Ballroom, called it Old Timey Charleston. Not sure when the name 1920s Charleston was applied to this style, but I'm pretty sure it's a modern invention used to delineate stylistic differences between it and later styles of Charleston. And to be honest, I'm not really sure what the best name to use is since there doesn't seem to be universal or historical agreement on terminology. So for this video, Old Timey Charleston will be called 1920s or Flapper Charleston and newer Charleston will be 1940s or collegiate Charleston. The main feature that gives this style its flavor, of course, comes from the music, which has a particular rhythmic vibe. First, let's learn the steps, then we'll talk about the music. Cause I know you're here to learn steps. I got you, boo. Just follow along at first, and if you're lost, don't worry, at the end of the song, we'll have a more complete breakdown. Anytime, honey mine, you feel lonely. Charleston is so much more than just that shape. In my opinion, it's really a combination of kicks and touches in different directions, and you can reshuffle those to make so many different variations. That's what makes it a full dance instead of just a move. For example, instead of doing the full shape, just stay on one leg and touch that foot. Just touch in front. Play with shifting your weight. You can also see how these ankle twists affect other prominent flapper Charleston moves. Most importantly, believe in what you're doing. Alright, if you didn't get all of that, don't worry about it. Let's have a more complete breakdown of those ankle twisties and the full shape. The overall shape goes forward and back. If you're having trouble, say to yourself, front, back, back, front, front, back, back, front. Notice that it's kind of like you're walking. So when your right leg goes back, your right arm comes forward. When your left leg goes back, your left arm comes forward. If you're having trouble, focus on your left hand coming forward on the one and five of the move. Now let's work on those ankle twists. It's like you're clicking your heels on every odd beat. Click, 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 click. When that feels good, try to do the same thing with your weight shifted on one leg. Then when you're ready, shift to the other leg. The timing of the heel click never changes. As you feel more confident, you can make the twist more dramatic by stepping directly behind or even past your other foot. If you keep your knees together, it will further highlight the effect. 
Notice I have a healthy bounce going on every beat. Among other reasons, it helps unstick my foot from the floor so it can twist without hurting my knees. Eventually, you won't have to force your foot to twist. As your toe hits the ground, the follow through from your leg will get your foot to twist for you. All right, we've done some Charleston. Now let's talk about the music that created it. This is gonna be an overgeneralization because of course, music didn't just change style and instrumentation across the entire United States overnight. Additionally, instrumentation was sometimes different on recordings than in person due to challenges and limitations with early recording equipment. To me, generally speaking, Jazz in the teens and 20s sounded more upright and marching rather than horizontal. Now there are a number of reasons for this and all instruments kind of contribute to this sound, but in my opinion, the main contributors are the sousaphone, that marching tuba, and the banjo. So for a terrible but YouTube usable example, let's say the banjo is going a bing 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 and the sousaphone is being played by human breath. So in general it's playing two beats instead of every beat. So it might be going something like a bing 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 and maybe the drummer is on a snare kind of doing something like a bing 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 good old rhythm changes. As time progressed, preferences, recording technology, amplification, drum kits, all kinds of things changed. So for the music that inspired what's frequently called 30s and 40s style Charleston, you have a rhythm guitar. The sousaphone was replaced by the upright bass or the double bass, and it being a stringed instrument totally changed the game. In addition to that plucked sound with that long longer note and that longer sustain, it didn't require human breath, so it was much easier to play every single beat, also known as four to the bar. This also gave them the ability to do more walking lines, which again totally changed the feel of the music and made it sound like it was walking, like it was moving somewhere. The drum kit has now changed substantially, and one of those changes is that time is now kept frequently on the hi-hat with that classic feeling. <laughs> For a lot of the music we dance to, the piano player has also changed because a lot of the music we dance to is a big band, so the piano player no longer has to spell out every single beat. They can now comp, they can do little fills here and there. <laughs> If you're a Lindy Hopper, probably the rhythm section that most embodies what we love is the Count Basie rhythm section, which is going to be Walter Page on upright bass, Freddie Green on rhythm guitar, Joe Jones on drums, and of course, Count Basie himself on the piano. They did some good stuff that croup. They changed the world. So now, instead of these vertical beats with lots of space in between them, we have these beats that kind of bleed into each other, very horizontal. Now, just like with the music, it's hard to say how and when the dance changed and if that change was ubiquitous. It can also be hard to tease out what we think and have been told versus what is actually documented. However, what I think, based on vintage footage, is that kicking instead of tapping and a lower, more forward posture became more prevalent with this musical change. I definitely recommend listening to the differences between different eras of jazz and trying to listen to the rhythm section in particular. Check out Louis Armstrong and his Hot Fives and Hot Sevens, legendary for a reason, and compare to Count Basie. Does it make you want to move differently? Something that's challenging is hearing the rhythm section past the very impressive horn work and past the incredible changes that have happened in recording technology. So if you can, check out live music. That stuff is so powerful. With that in mind, let's listen to some classic big band style music and see how that affects our Charleston. Now, because this Charleston is still basically just flapper Charleston done to different music, the body mechanics, such as the healthy bounce, the way you coordinate your arms and legs is going to be exactly the same.
just like with flapper style Charleston, you can use the pieces of the basic to recombine them and create a full dance. comfortable, bring back those 20s ankle twists and see how that affects your style. You'll notice that sometimes in this style I kick backwards and sometimes I rock step. You can do either one, they are rhythmically interchangeable. Now of course the way you hear music is very individual. If you hear a song and you want to be more upright instead of low or more low instead of upright, that is totally fine and nobody can say that you're wrong. Keep open ears and an open mind and the more you dance, the more your body will be good at responding to the music. So now after all this, I do have one question that I'd love your help with. Charleston is not only a dance, but it's also a rhythm. Sounds exactly like that song, Charleston. Dum, dum. Dum, 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 dum. A dotted quarter note followed by an eighth note. We don't dance with that rhythm. Why? If you know, let me know. I hope you had fun and learned a lot. And if you did, click like and subscribe and comment and do all that YouTube algorithm stuff. If you like the music, we have Alice Spencer and her monkey butlers and the Brooks Prumo Orchestra. And you can find a link to buying that music in the description. And half of the money that I get from this YouTube channel goes towards organizations that support African diasporic artists and art because Lindy Hop is a black dance. And the best way to learn how to do that dance is by doing it, y'all.